Welcome to John Gets Games. Today, I'll be teaching you how to play Arc Nova, and for that, I'll be using Tabletop Simulator. After I'm done teaching, I will then play a full game with my friends Anastasia and Nick, and once that video is posted, you'll be able to find a link to it down below in the description or by clicking the I up there in the top corner. It's worth noting that video will be posted many days after this one is. Now, I do want to ask before we move on that if you enjoy this video, that you please click the like button for it down below as well as the subscribe button for the channel. In addition to that, if you'd like to directly support the channel and the creation of videos just like this one in the future, then please go to jongetsgames.com slash support. There you'll find a bunch of ways that you can really help things out, and many of them come with perks, like watching some videos early and advertisement-free, as well as voting on which of those videos are made. All right, it's now time for me to teach you how to play Arc Nova. Out here, we have the game set up in Tabletop Simulator, ready to be taught. Now, before I start, I would like to ask that you please turn on the Klingon subtitles. I might make mistakes as I'm teaching you the game, and that will let me put corrections on the screen where you should be able to see them. I'd also like to mention that since we're using Tabletop Simulator today, we're going to use money counters in order to track how much money we have instead of actual money tokens. Well, let's start things off with a brief overview of this game. Each player is running their own zoo in front of them, and as we're playing the game, on our turns we're going to take one action by sliding one of these cards down and then doing what it says. After that, the rest of these cards will slide over, and then the next person can take their turn in clockwise order. Now, these cards will let us do a wide variety of things. We can add new enclosures into our park. We can also play animal cards out in front of us. Those will cost money, and we'll also have to place them into enclosures by flipping those tiles over. Players can also put sponsor cards in front of them, and these will give various in-game effects as well as end-game effects, depending on the card. And it's worth noting that this game comes with a gigantic deck of cards, each one of which is unique. Now, players are going to be adding these cards into their hand as we play the game, and we are also going to be sending various associates out to this board. Over here, we can do a wide variety of actions, and one important one involves performing conservation projects, where we can put cubes down on top of each of these, and we just start the game with these three. There's others that we can find in this deck of cards that can be placed up here to have even more goals to go after. Speaking of goals, let's now talk about how we actually win this game. The board has two tracks going around the outside. One is the appeal track, and the other one is the conservation track, which is this green track in the middle. Now, as we play the game, we're going to gain appeal as well as conservation, and we're going to keep playing the game until at least one player has these two tokens intersect and potentially go past. Now, once that happens, the game end will be triggered, and once the game is over, we can score potentially extra points from the cards that we've played. At that point, the player whose gap between their appeal marker and their conservation marker is the biggest will be the winner of the game. So, that's an overview of what the game is like, and now let's talk about some specific rules. Now, I'm not going to be giving you a comprehensive rule teach because this game has a lot of various effects that show up on the cards that we have in our hands, but I'm going to teach you enough so that you can follow along if you watch our playthrough, and as we play these cards out, we'll explain what these various effects do while we are going. Now, as I mentioned in the overview, on a player's turn, that player has to select one of these cards that they have in front of them, and they are going to slide it down. Then they will perform all of the effects on that card, and then they will slide this card to the left, pushing the rest of the cards over to the right to fill in. After that, the next player can go. And on that note, let's actually talk about what these specific five action cards are, because these really are the central engine of the overall game. Well, I think let's start with the animal's action. Now, before we go into the specifics of this card, I'd actually like to talk about the strength of actions in general. You'll notice these numbers along the top, and that is the strength of the card that you activate. So this is a strength value 3 animal activation. Now, players can gain some of these plus 1 strength tokens, and you can get rid of these to add plus 1 to the overall strength of a turn. And that means we could get rid of this to add 1 to the 3, and then perform a strength value 4 animal action if we wanted to. The effect that strength has on an action is going to be different for each of these, and for animals, you can see that when you take this action, you can play animal cards from your hand, and you can play one or two of them, depending on your strength value. If the strength is one, then you actually can't perform this action at all, because you need to have at least two strength. Now, you can use animals when they're in the one slot, you would just need to use at least one of these tokens to increase the strength value. So, for animals, you can see that once you get to a strength value of 5 or more, you could play 2 cards from your hand. Now, I do say more, because you are allowed to go above 5 strength with these tokens over here, and sometimes going above it is actually beneficial. Now, before I move on, I do want to mention that every single one of these cards can be upgraded through various means as the game is being played. The upgraded side of each of these is similar but different from the one on the basic side, and for the teacher, I'm just going to talk about the basic sides of these cards. You'll be able to see how some or all of these upgraded cards work by watching our full playthrough video. 
Now let's do a full example turn with this animal's action. At the moment, we have a strength value 3, so that means we can play one animal from our hand. As you can see, we have a bunch of cards, and animal cards have this golden banner in the middle. Let's say we want to play this frilled lizard right over here, and that means we put this face up in front of us. And the next thing that we have to do is check for restrictions, which would show up right over here. Our filled lizard doesn't have any, but as you can see, this northern cassowary does have an extra restriction, which must be met before that animal can be played. I'll describe what this restriction is later, so let's now come back over here to our filled lizard. After meeting all potential restrictions, we now have to pay the currency cost that shows up in this black square icon. The filled lizard is going to cost us 12 money. And then we have to actually house this lizard. This hexagon right here with a 2 in it says that we have to put this lizard into an enclosure that is at least too large. And that number tells you how many of these hexagon spaces are taken up in our zoo by the enclosure that we put that animal into. As you can see at the start of the game with map A, we all have an empty size 3 enclosure. So that means 3 is equal to or greater than this number. And that means we can put the frilled lizard right over here. Now, sometimes there are extra restrictions. For example, this one right over here shows that mountain icon next to the two. That means there must be at least one rocky space next to the enclosure this frilled lizard goes into. Fortunately, there is a rock space right over here, so that means this is going to satisfy the enclosure needs for this, and we can show that we put frilled lizards over here by flipping that tile over. Now, thematically, we just remember that the frilled lizards are over there. We don't actually need to know what enclosure this specific animal is in as we move on through the game. Now you might have noticed this other icon right over there, and that says that this lizard, instead of being put into a regular enclosure, can go into a reptile house. I'll explain how we gain these later on, but this is what they look like. Now that means instead of flipping this enclosure over for that reptile, we can take a cube of our color and put it onto one of these open spots to show that the frilled lizard is taking up one-fifth of this overall reptile house, and that means we can leave other enclosures open for other animals. Now this is called a reptile house, and every reptile in the game can be placed into one of these. There's also a large bird aviary, which some birds can go into. At this point, let's continue on our example by saying we put the frilled lizard right over here. After that, we've satisfied all of the requirements and costs for this animal, and now we can gain the benefits. You see down here it says Sprint 1, and then it tells you what Sprint 1 actually means. In this case, that means we could draw one card from the top of the face down deck. That deck is right over here, so we can draw the top card and add that into our hand. Inside this deck, there are various animal cards, as well as sponsorship cards and new conservation projects that players can work on throughout the game. So this card can be placed into our hand, and then after that, we are going to gain an appeal value. This shows a 5 within that ticket icon, and you can see that ticket icon shows up on the outside of the board, so that means we could gain 5 appeal by moving our token 5 spaces up on the track. Now it's worth pointing out that some animals have an after finishing effect. You only perform that effect once you've completed the entire animal's action that you are doing, including potentially playing multiple animal cards. Once all that happens, you can perform all of those after finishing effects that showed up on the cards that you played. The last thing to mention about this card are these icons in the top right. Now these show a variety of different things. That is a reptile icon to show that this is a reptile, and that icon is a region-based icon showing that this frilled lizard comes from the Australia region of the world. Now these icons by themselves don't mean anything, but many cards as well as other effects in the game will cause various things to happen based on the icons that show up on the cards that are played. So that's how we play animal cards, and once again, once we finish our turn, we slide the activated card over to the left. Now the next person can go, but we're going to keep focusing over here as we explain more actions. Well, we've already seen how we can occupy these enclosures, so now let's see how we can get new ones. We do that with the build action, and as you can see, it says we can build one building with a maximum size of X, which is the strength value of the action that we're taking. In this example, we have a strength value of 5, which means with this build action, we could construct a building out here with a size of up to 5. We could, of course, discard this to make that up to 6 if we wanted to. When we look back at the build card, it says we're going to have to pay 2 money for each space that we use, and at the moment, we could place kiosks, pavilions, standard enclosures, as well as petting zoos down. Those options are shown down here. As you can see, these are petting zoos, these are enclosures of various sizes, and then this is a pavilion, while that is a kiosk. Now, once we upgrade the build action, we'll gain access to building a reptile house like we've already seen, as well as these large bird aviaries that work the same way as reptile houses. Now, when we build new things out onto our board, they must always go next to a previously placed tile, or if you don't have any tiles placed already on the board, you can put it next to any of the edge spaces around the map. On map A, we always start with a size 3 enclosure, so we'll have to play next to that. We also have a kiosk printed here on the board. 
So once again, the size of the building that we put down is going to dictate the cost, and the strength of the action will dictate how big that one building that we're building can be. For this example, we have a strength 5, so let's just say that we put a size 5 enclosure down into our zoo. As I said, this has to be placed adjacent to a previously placed building, and you need at least one little side touching the other building. So we could put this like this or that, and you can also spin these around if you like, but you are never allowed to cover up any water locations or rock locations on the board. Now, whenever you place something down like this, for example, and you cover up various icons, you immediately gain the benefit of those icons. This right here would just get us five money immediately, whereas that would get us another one of these one-time use strength tokens. And then there are some other icons on here, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So we could place this like that if we wanted to. And of course, we've left a gap over there, so maybe that's not a great placement, but let's just say that this is where we put it. Once again, we do have to pay money for that, and it's going to be two money for each space that we just covered up in our zoo. So for this example, we covered up five spaces, which means that's going to cost us 10 of our money. Before moving on, I do want to point out that on our player boards, it shows us the various options that we can build. And up top, you can see this large bird aviary and reptile house. Below those, it shows this value to shovel, which means, again, you can only build these once you have upgraded the build action, and I'll explain how we upgrade those later on. The final thing to say is that down here with the kiosk, you can never put a kiosk closer than three spaces away from another kiosk. That means we would not be allowed to place this here because that's just two spaces away, whereas we could place it over there if we wanted to. I suppose the other thing to mention is that every time you build a pavilion into your zoo, you gain one appeal. We can see that icon right over there, and you just get it the one time. So that's how we build new things into our zoo. And I think let's now talk about sponsors. You can perform this action in order to play one sponsor card with a maximum level of your strength value from your hand, or you could do a break action and gain some money. Now let's talk about playing those cards first. As you can see, this currently has a strength value of four. And when we look at our hand, the sponsorship cards have this blue banner in the middle and a strength value threshold in the top left. As you can see, this free range New World Monkeys has a strength value of five. So that means we need to get rid of a token in order to actually play that with this four spot. Or we just have to wait until this got to the five spot in order to play that sponsorship card out. Now, once you've chosen a valid sponsor, you can put it in front of you. And it's worth noting, some do have requirements. For example, this says a maximum appeal of 25 which means in order to play our card, our appeal value has to be at 25 or lower. For this example, let's say we put this ornithologist out, which we can because it has a strength requirement of four, and we have four from this activation. Now, these sponsors have various effects that are explained on the bottom and with icons along the top, and that lets you actually stack these cards on top of each other, just leaving the top banner visible. The same can be said for these animals. You can stack them on top of each other so that just the stuff at the top is still visible to all players. The effects on sponsors can be pretty varied. This example right here says that each time a bird icon is played into any player's zoo, then this player would gain three money. Now it's explained down here in text, but you can also see that with the icons here at the top of the card, and you can see that this has a bird icon, which means when you play this, it activates itself, giving you three currency. As I said, there's a wide variety of these sponsorship cards. This free range New World Monkeys doesn't have any effects at the top, besides of course having a primate icon, which could interact with some other effect. But we can see down here that it has an immediate effect, and it also has an hourglass icon, which is going to be an end game scoring effect. These immediate actions are performed as soon as you put it down. For example, this one right here says you gain one appeal for each connected space with a placement bonus currently in your zoo. On the right side of this card, it says that we would gain one conservation point for every two unconnected spaces with a placement bonus that are still visible in our zoo once the game is over. Now, I did say that it's good to splay these cards out and cover up a lot of the text, and you might be wondering, well, what happens when you cover up important information like this? Fortunately, the icon at the top shows this brown banner to remind you that this card has an endgame scoring condition, so you can either go back to that, or you could just leave these endgame scoring cards face up and easier to see. Obviously, the bottom part of this card can easily be covered up because this one happens to have iconography explaining everything about the card at the top. So that's how we play sponsor cards from our hand. Now the other option when we activate sponsors is down here, and it says we can do a break equal to the strength value of this action, and we'd gain money equal to the strength value of this action. Well, money is pretty simple. We would just take four money in this example, but then we'd have to do a break of four. And that specifically relates to this break track here on the board. 
Every time you do a break action, you move this token over to the left equal to that number of times. So for example, we'd go one, two, three, four, and you'll notice this started at the three spot because this example has a three player game happening. Now, whenever this break token reaches or exceeds this spot right over here, the player who reached or exceeded that spot will gain one strength token as a bonus. And then at the end of their turn, that player is going to hold on to this token as every player then proceeds to perform all of these different break effects. After we've gone through all of these, this token will go right back over here, depending on the player count, and then the next player can take their turn as normal. Now, I'll talk about all of these break details a little bit later on in the teach. So, that's how we perform the sponsorship action. Now, the next one I'd like to talk about is pretty simple in comparison to the others so far, and that is cards. When you perform this action, the first thing that happens is you'll do a break of two, so you move that break token over twice, and then you can draw one or more cards from the face-down deck, or you can perform a snap action. At the bottom of this card, there is a table which tells us how we're going to perform this action depending on the strength that we have. In this example, we have four strength, and that means we would draw two random cards from the top of the deck. If instead this was a strength value three cards action, we would draw those two random cards, but then we'd have to discard one card from our hand, and it wouldn't necessarily have to be a card that we just drew from the deck. So as the strength goes up, you can draw more cards, and the other option that you can do is snap. Down below, you can see in order to do a snap action, you need a strength value of five or more. And the way you perform that snap action is you take any one of these six cards here in the middle of the table and you put it into your hand. It does not matter how far your reputation token is. And I haven't talked about these just yet. And don't worry, I'll get to those soon. So we could snap this saltwater crocodile, for example, again, as long as we had a strength value of five or more. So that was a pretty simple card action to explain, and now we have just one more, and that is the association action. Now this says we can perform one association task with a maximum value of the strength value that we're activating. In this case, we have a strength value of 5. The way this works is we can take associate workers from our player board and place those over here onto the associate board in order to perform a specific action. As you can see, there are four different spots you can put your worker into, and you have to have a strength value of at least that number in order to place into that spot. Now, when we place these workers down, we'll have to put either one or two, and that will depend on if we have any of our workers already in that area. Up here, you can see that if that specific strength area of the association board has none of your worker, you just put one down. Whereas if you already have one worker there, then you'll have to put two of your workers into that same spot, which means you will then have three. Once you have three workers in one of these spots, you will not be able to perform that again until they clear out when a break is activated. Once again, this restriction only applies to your own workers. It does not matter if any other workers are within these specific spots. Well, I think we should talk about all of these effects, and we'll start with this one right over here. When you activate this spot, you can take any one of these partnership zoo tokens that's currently over here. If one of these spots is empty, then you obviously cannot take that token, and these will refill during the break activation. So, for example, we can take this Australia Zoo Partnership token, and then we can put this onto the lowest value empty partnership spot on our board. As you can see, we have four of these spots, and in order to place it into the third or fourth spot, you actually have to have upgraded your associate action to the level two side. Once again, I'll talk about upgrading soon, and when we come back over here, if you ever cover up any specific bonus icons, you immediately do what it says. Now, you will have this for the rest of the game, and you can only have at most four of these, and this right over here says that for the rest of the game, you get a minus three discount on the money cost when you put the applicable icon type of animals down into your area. So if we'd done this first and then put the frilled lizard into play, we would have spent nine money instead of 12. It's also worth noting that this counts as one of these icons in case you had any effects that activated with that icon. Now, we actually have a good example of that in our hand. I mentioned before that you have to meet all of the requirements of an animal card when you play them, and this one says you must have the associated region partnership tile in order to play the northern cassowary, so you cannot even play this down until you have the Australia partnership tile, and then of course this would give us a minus three discount, so we'd only have to spend nine currency instead of 12 to play that animal out. Of course, we would have to put it into an enclosure, and I already explained how that works. The next thing to talk about is partnering up with the university. When you go over here, you can take any one of these that are available. And again, if it's not there, you can't take it. And these do get refilled during a break activation. As you can see, there are exactly three different types of universities. This one gives you two of that icon, which could be important for various restrictions or benefits. This one gives you one of that icon as well as two reputation. And this gives you one reputation and increases your hand size up to five. Now, I haven't talked about reputation or hand size just yet, and I promise I'll get to those soon. Once you select one of these, you're going to put it onto your player board. 
and this works just like the zoos where you put it down into the lowest empty spot on your board for them. Now, I do want to mention that you can never have more than one of any university tile, and since there are three tiles total, you can have one of each of them as you're playing the game. Of course, the order in which you place these down is going to be important and will be dictated by the cards that you have in hand. I do want to point out also that you can never have more than one partnership token for a region out here on your board. After that, it's now time to talk about the Strength 5 Associate option, which lets you work on a conservation project. Now, at the start of the game, we dealt three of these out for a three-player game, and when you do this, you can either contribute to one of these projects, or you could take a conservation project that you have from your hand and place it up at the top, and then immediately contribute towards that specific project. Now, when you place cards up here, if there were any cards already up here, you simply slide those to the left. As you can see, in a three-player game, there will be exactly three of these. If there were three up here already, when you add a new one, the one that was on this spot will actually be placed into a discard pile and any cubes on it will be removed. Now, in order to work on a conservation project, you have to meet the specific requirement. As you can see for this one, it's called Aquatic and it requires water icons in your zoo. Specifically, you need to have two, four, or five of those icons and those show up as water restrictions in the enclosure requirements for animals that you place out. So in order to work on that conservation project, you need to have various animals in front of you that require being placed into enclosures that are adjacent to one or more water spaces. The game comes with quite a variety of different conservation options. For example, down here, Reptiles says you have to have two, four, or five reptile tags in your zoo, and then other things like this one says you have to have two, four, or five Americas tags in your zoo. Once again, this does count as a tag, so if you partner with the America Zoo token, that would count as one towards this conservation project. Now, whenever you are completing one of these, you're going to put one of your cubes down onto the applicable spot. So, for example, if we had four reptiles in our zoo, we'd put a cube down onto this location here. Those cubes are going to be taken from our board. During setup, we put these seven cubes right onto these spots, and you can choose any of these of your choice, and then immediately perform the effect. These three down right over here immediately get you what they say, and that's it for the rest of the game. Whereas up here, you immediately gain these benefits, and then every time we do a break activation, you will take that specific effect again as income. So if you place this out early, you will get one conservation point immediately, and potentially more as the game goes on, or as removing this one gets you 12 money immediately, and that's it for the rest of the game. To continue this example, let's say we took this one right here. We would then take that cube and place it onto that spot, and then that is blocked for the rest of the game, so that means if anyone else wants to work on reptiles, they need to have two or five, the four spot is full. Now we also get the benefit, this one says we get four conservation points, and of course we pulled this from the one conservation bonus spot on our board, so we would get five total in this example. When we gain conservation points, we're going to move our conservation token clockwise on the green locations on the board. So we would go from 0 all the way up to the 5 spot right over here. Now you may have noticed that at the 2, 5, 8, and 10 spots, there are specific effects that happen. And if you cross over and get to multiple of these, you perform them in order. Let's focus in a bit, because as you can see at the 2 spot, these are printed on the board, but at the 5 and 8 spot, these are actually random tokens that we put down during setup. Now when you land on this 5 spot, you can choose any of these options, and if you choose one of these tokens, you remove it, which means other players will not have that option once they've reached that location. If both of these are gone, obviously there's still going to be one option left over, and getting money is certainly a good thing. Now, I haven't described what many of these icons are just yet, and again, don't worry, I will get to all of these before the teach is done. So that's how we perform conservation, and the final option over here is an easy one to do, and that gives you two reputation. On that note, I think it's now time to talk about that reputation track. This track can be found going down the middle of the board, and it is associated with the various cards that are face up on display. When you increase your reputation, you just go from one spot to the next. As you can see, there are lines that split these into smaller sections. Now, reputation by itself doesn't do anything, but there are various effects in the game that do utilize your reputation value. One of those can be found right over here. That bonus says that when you take this, you can take up to three face-up cards from the display that are within your reputation amount. That means the card has to be in one of these spots that is to the left or equal to the spot where your reputation token is. So right now, with a reputation value of three, we would have access to these two cards. Obviously, as we increase our reputation, we would have access to more and more of these cards when performing a bonus like this one. 
In fact, four out of our five action cards when upgraded have something to do with our reputation range. For example, cards over here lets you draw face-up cards from the board into your hand, depending on if those cards are within your reputation range. And then sponsors, animals, and association all let you actually play a card from the board directly into play, as if those cards were in your hand, but of course you have to be within reputation range, and all of these also have an additional cost. That cost is simple, you just have to pay money equal to the number value of where you took that card. So if you took this one right here using one of those upgraded cards to immediately put it into play, you would have to spend three extra money in addition to the 12 money that that card cost. Now at this point, I'm sure you are very curious to know how we actually upgrade those cards, and there are four ways that we can do that in the game. The first of those shows up over here, and when you land on the spot, you can either upgrade one of your action cards by flipping it over, or you can gain a new associate worker. Once again, when you upgrade a card, you simply flip it wherever it's at, and then you will gain those extra benefits for the rest of the game. The other option for that specific benefit lets you unlock a new worker, and you take the bottommost one and put it over here, which means they will be available to you for the rest of the game. Sometimes when you remove these, you might also get a benefit. For example, this one right over here gets you two conservation points as soon as they are unlocked. Having more workers will let you do more of those association actions and also let you do those actions multiple times because if you already have a worker on that specific strength action, you'll have to send two workers to activate that again. The next way to upgrade cards involves getting up to five or more reputation. Once you hit this spot, you can flip over one of those cards of your choice. After that, there are just two other ways you can upgrade cards, and those show up here on the University and Zoo Partnerships. As soon as you cover this icon up, you can flip one of your action cards, and what that means is you can flip a maximum of four of these cards over during the game, and of course on that uh, conservation track, if you unlock one of these workers instead of flipping a card, then you can flip a maximum of three of these throughout that specific play. When we focus back at the reputation track, you'll notice it has a variety of benefits that you'll get as you move down. When you get to the 8 spot, that will let you unlock a new worker, and then over here you can draw a card within your reputation. At the 11 spot, you can gain one conservation point, and you will continue to take these bonuses as you increase your reputation. But I do want to point out that everything past 9 is red, and that means you must have upgraded your card draw action to the 2 side in order to proceed past this point. If you end up being so good at reputation that you're maxed out at 15, then every future reputation value will give you one appeal. Well, at this point, let's come back to the association board, because I do want to mention that once you have upgraded your association action to the two side, you will then have the ability of performing this once per association action. This is a simple donation where you're going to spend the associated amount of money to gain one conservation point, and then you'll put a cube from your overall supply down onto this. You do not remove that cube from your board. So the more this happens, the more expensive it will get. But of course, gaining conservation points by spending money is a good way to gain extra points as the game is moving on. While we're on the topic of upgrading cards, I do want to point out that players are not allowed to cover up these spots until they have flipped over their build action to the two side. Once that happens, you can cover these up, of course, as long as you are adjacent to other buildings. And that's important because if at any point a player has covered up all of their non-rock, non-water spaces, then they will immediately get seven appeal and move up on the track accordingly. At this point, I am almost done talking about actions, but I do want to say that there is a sixth option that you can do on your turn instead of activating one of these cards. The way this works is you're going to take any one of your cards, say this one right here, you will then slide the rest of these over, and you won't activate the card that you chose or any of the rest of them, and then you can take one of these strength tokens from the supply and add it into your personal area. Now, obviously, this is not something you should plan towards, but if you have no actions that you actually feel like doing on your turn, you do have this as an option. At this point, I'd like to draw particular focus to these specific 10 cards that show up in that main draw deck of 212 cards. Now, these are the 10 interactive cards that come in the game, and you can tell by this yellow and red octagon symbol that shows up on each of them. There are four of these different symbols. The top one is Pilfer, and that lets you actually take money or a random card from an opponent's hand. Down here, the Venom symbol puts Venom tokens down onto action cards, and whenever you do an action that does not have a Venom token on it, you actually lose money until you take that action. Up here, Hypnosis lets you actually take an action with an opponent's action card, which will cause them to move their action cards around. And lastly, Constriction over here puts Constriction tokens down, and when you perform actions with those tokens, you do it at a strength value of 2 less. The other thing I'd like to point out about these specific 10 cards is this blue area on the bottom. Now, when you're playing this game solo, you ignore the top text and you just do what it says down in the bottom. And when you're playing with other players, you ignore the solo text at the bottom. 
The final thing I'd like to say about these 10 specific cards is that the designer mentioned an official variant, where if you don't want to play with these interactive abilities with your opponents, you can instead use the solo effects down here when playing a multiplayer game, and instead you ignore the interactive effects of each of these 10 cards. Well, at this point, I think it's finally time to talk about break activation. Remember, this happens once the break token reaches this spot or tries to go past it. And what we do is, in order, we perform all of these five steps. The first one has every player discarding down to their hand size. That is three at the start of the game, and five if you happen to have the university partnership tile that increases you to five. After that, if players have any of these tokens that show up on their cards, they can get rid of them. And I won't actually describe what these specifically do, because they are specific to various cards that may or may not show up while we're playing the game. After that, we can reset the associate board. And the way this works is all of the workers will be returned back to the players, and then we will refill all of these so that there is exactly one of the university tiles out here, and so that there's exactly one of each of the zoo partnership tiles on the board. Next up, the cards in the first and second position in the middle of the board will be removed, and you can tell that because of this icon that shows that they're removed during that coffee break. So these would simply be tossed into the discard pile, and then we slide the rest of the cards down and refill the row, although in Tabletop Simulator, I have a nice button I can press to do that automatically. The final thing we do during a break is gain income. Now we can get this from a variety of different spots, and the first of which comes straight from the appeal track. As you can see, there is a currency number that goes around the outside, and you will get this amount of money depending on the spot where your appeal token is. So if we were right over here, we would get 10 currency, whereas if we were over there on the 29 appeal spot, we would gain 20 currency during this break. After that, we will gain currency from kiosks in our zoo, and we can focus on the player board and see down here that next to the kiosk, it does say that we get income. Now, every kiosk is going to generate one money for each different building that it is adjacent to, as well as enclosure that is occupied. So that means this kiosk right here is going to get one money because it's next to one occupied enclosure. If that was like this, that would still not affect it because this is currently unoccupied. If this was flipped, however, that kiosk would get two money. And if we were to expand our example out a little bit like this, now that kiosk is going to get two money because it's next to two different buildings. This right here is a petting zoo, and specific animals must be placed into petting zoos by putting cubes down. And it doesn't matter how many cubes you have in that petting zoo for kiosk activation. Next up, players might gain income from sponsorship cards. This one, for example, right here says that during income, you will get three, six, or nine money if you have one, three, or five of those bird icons in your area. You know this is income because it has a purple background, and that matches this purple right over here for income. Now, it's really important to point out that any icons that show up on the left side of a card are just there for requirements. Those never count as icons for various benefits that you could get from things like this sponsorship vultures card. The last thing we gain income for are the conservation cubes that we have removed from the top area of our board. You can see those four right over here, and you only do the ones where you've removed a cube. So you could gain conservation points, money, free size 2 enclosures, as well as one snap action, which lets you take any of the cards face up on the table and put it into your hand, no matter what your reputation is. At this point, I want to draw your attention back to this conservation track and say that this icon right over here, when chosen, gets you a free size 3 enclosure that you can place, and that one gets you three of those strength tokens that you can put on your board, and you can never have more than five of those. Now, the big one I want to talk about is what happens at the 10 spot. Now, as soon as any one player reaches 10 or more conservation points, that will be the moment where everyone must simultaneously discard one of their two endgame scoring cards. Now, I haven't talked about these cards yet, and during setup, each player is going to gain two. Now, at that moment, when somebody gets 10 or more conservation points, each player has to get rid of one of these, and the other one is going to score them zero to four conservation points once the game is over, depending on how well they met the specific condition that shows up on that card. If you somehow get to the end of the game and no one has reached 10 conservation points, then before final scoring, each player discards one of these before scoring the other one. Well, I think it's now time to talk about how the game ends. As we continue playing the game, we are going to be getting appeal going counterclockwise around the board and gaining conservation points going clockwise. And at a certain point, once these two tokens are within the same area, that will trigger the end of the game. So if this token was like that, that wouldn't quite be enough because the area is dictated by this conservation spot. So if this moved over here, those would be in the same area. And likewise, if this moved over there, they would be in the same area. Now, once the appeal token meets or exceeds this conservation token, that will trigger the end of the game. 
and the active player will finish their turn, and then every other player will take one more turn. If this happens to happen during a break activation, then every player will take one more turn. Once we have all finished playing the game, it will then be time for final scoring. The way final scoring works is players will add up all of the points from final scoring cards that they have played, and they also take the one final scoring card that they have in their hand, and they score that. Now again, it's possible that players might have two when we start final scoring, in which case each player has to discard one of them, and then they will score the other one, gaining the various benefits depending on the condition on that card. Once we've each activated all of our endgame scores, it's then time to figure out who won the game. The way we do this is we first figure out what our score is, and that is going to be the difference between our appeal value and our conservation value. The way we do this is we find the lowest appeal value within that conservation value area. So for example, this would have a lowest value of 43, and then you find the difference between that value and where the appeal marker is. So in this example, red would have a final score of 2, and blue would have a final score of 5. At this point, the player with the highest positive score is going to be the winner. At this point, it's time to wrap up the teach, but before I get to that, I do want to mention that the game comes with a great icon overview to help explain what all of these various icons mean. Now, at this point in the teach, I've taught most of what's going on in the game, but there is still a decent amount of mechanics that I haven't covered based off of the various cards that can come out. For example, there are special buildings that you can place down based off of which particular cards you play. Those can get put into your area to potentially increase your kiosk income, as well as a variety of other potential effects. These are just one example of something that I haven't explained just yet, and if you'd like to potentially learn how those work, as well as a bunch of other things in this game, then please check out the full playthrough that we recorded. In that, we play against my friends Anastasia and Nick, and once that video is posted, you'll be able to find a link to it down below in the description of this video. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.